Okay, well, uh, this is the last lecture of the whole week. So I would, uh, and it, sorry, and then firework, yeah. And I would like to thank, uh, anyway, the organizers for this wonderful meeting and give me the opportunity. For me, it's, of course, an honor to be here and to lecture, I mean, the best neuroscientists of the world. So, no? So my topic of the day is the brain simulation and addiction. This is, a, of course, a very small topic. I worked four years on that topic, and I will show you how it works, what the data are. But I worked actually 10 years to reach that goal, DBS and addiction. So what I would like to do today with you is take you on a journey with me and show you how I eventually got to deep brain simulation as a treatment for addiction. As I said, it took me 10 years. So I would like to start at the beginning when I started and share with you my reasoning and the questions I had and then slowly go on step by step and show you how I got to deep brain simulation for addiction. I had many questions, most of them were wrong, and I had as well many answers, some of them were wrong as well, but you could advise me of course, and we have now new techniques, so maybe if I have a question you can give me the right answer. Okay, one thing, I, and I need to stress that, is that, I mean, it's like much more like a philosophical reflection. Um, this is uh, the mind and the brain. I don't know whether you're aware of the Cartesian dualism. Do you know that? Does, what, what does it mean, dualism? Anyone an idea? Sorry? Sorry? Yes, separation between mind and body. Is that dualism? I think is saying that the mind is Who is a dualist in this room? No one. Everyone is a monist. What is a monist? <laughs> Sorry? To be the same thing. Okay. But why is dualism so popular in this neuroscience? Yeah. Uh, more the, I see some people nodding. Other, other. You have as well a comment? Mm, I think that is more religious related than psychological. It is what related? Sorry. Religious more than psychological. Okay. So there is something difficult with dualism. Well, not difficult, but if you look at it, the dualism, you should. I mean. Um, approach it, there are two ways. There's the ontological way and the epistemological way. Do you know the difference between ontology and epistemology? Ontology is like a philosophical word. It means how the things are. Of course, in the real world, mind and brain are the same. They're one single entity, identical. So from an ontological perspective, normal people are monists because and then a few people believe that there is a ghost outside the brain, which is the mind, and is in some strange way connected to the brain. So from ontological perspective, how it really is, we, most of us are monists. Do you agree with that? Yeah? Or is there someone who says, no, it's not true, we have a brain, and there is a separate mind somewhere? No one? Okay. But, yeah, you? So where is the physical in space? But it's, that's, yeah, it's possible. And there are people who think that they are separate identities matching the mind. But from an epistemological viewpoint, epistemology means the way how we perceive, how we understand the world, how we have organized our sciences, how we perceive the world, how easy it is to explain things most of us are dualists because it's quite hard to read, for example, Dostoevsky on one hand and see it as the same as studying a cell. This kind of dif this different. We have 
I mean, a different way of reading Dostoevsky and philosophers and doing neuroscience. So in the way we organize science and knowledge, we actually are, most of us are dualists. It's very effective. It helps me to become very effective in neuroscience and in behavior. If I do everything, mix up everything, then it starts to become very complicated. Okay, this is an old concept in Germany. Now we have it, Verstehen for the behavior and Erklären for the neuroscience. So that goes back to Dilti, the 19th century. It's very old and still we use it, but it's good from time to time to think about it. So my point is, and I'm always astonished that lately, the past two, three decades, we have, I mean, we put a huge effort in understanding the brain with neuroscience. We are very, I mean, we are into the details of cell activity, synapses and receptors and glutamate whatsoever. I mean, 20, 30 years of neuroscientific work, 30, 40,000 neuroscientists, huge investments, it all goes to the brain. But the behavior, the description of the behavior lately, what happened with that? Who is investing in accurate description of the brain, of the, of the mind, sorry? Which discipline is doing that? Psychology, but do you think they're doing a, a good job right now? So some people think that schizophrenia and depression, that you can translate it immediately into the brain, from the mind into the brain. That you can translate addiction as a concept immediately into the brain. But to me, addiction is like a, a novel of Dostoevsky. It's just a creation by our minds. So if I trying to translate addiction directly into the brain, it's like I'm saying there is like a neurobiological substrate of um, Mozart's Don Giovanni opera, which is highly unlikely if I make the same, if I like, if I make this comparison. So I think that in the past two decades, we, are, we have been a bit lazy and we should emphasize much more our precise, the behaviors that we want to translate in, in, into the bright and vice versa, of course. So what I would like to do, what I'd like to emphasize in my talk is that particular aspect of the behavior. And I'm gonna show you that through the development, development of my thinking, I often switched. I started with an idea that I had to translate this particular mind thing into neurobiological substrates, but when I found the neurobiological substrate, I thought I was completely wrong. I have to rethink the behavior and so on. So we have to, um, well, I think that that's, would be a nice way of doing neuroscientific research. Always question each day, which behaviors we want to translate into neurobiology and look for the etiology of these behaviors. Okay, so I would like to start with a question that I uh, puzzled me, uh, that puzzled me, I mean, a decade ago. I'm a psychiatrist and I started with obsessive compulsive patients um, and I started to work in Utrecht. I was, I mean, a junior scientist um, and I started to do some pharmacotherapy in OCD patients. And it struck me when I gave them serotonin reuptake inhibitors, antidepressants, that the effect was minimal. Um, actually, what I saw is that a lot of patients do not, do not respond to SSRIs. That's my starting point. Do, any, do, do you know obsessive compulsive disorder? Yeah? Everyone? Not everyone. Yeah? I was going to show you a, a small movie clip anyway, so that we, as they say, on the same page. And just to, sh to show you, and then you have to tell me what you think is the most prominent dysfunction in the movie clip. So because I said we were gonna be meticulous with our description of behavior, so I invite you to give me the essence of obsessive compulsive disorder, because all of you know OCD, no? Let's start, okay.
Okay, first of all, this is a long movie clip, and you're a new generation. I'm a psychiatrist, so I like to observe the audience. And I saw that a lot of you, I mean, started to get bored very fast after just 10, 15 seconds, no? It's quite boring looking at this clip after a while. How long do you think that this clip lasts here? Five minutes? <laughs> I think... So how much did it last? Did this how video long, clip... How long this person no, no, long just long this long video long. clip, how long this video clip is. Exactly, I don't think even a minute, it's very short. And still, looking at you, I saw people getting bored looking at that guy. So I took this from, just from YouTube. The actual real clip of this person is 20 minutes. And you got bored, I mean, after 65 seconds. And if you want to have the diagnosis of obsessive compulsive disorder, how long do you have to perform these kinds of behaviors at least? What is a criterion? One hour, at least one hour. Imagine checking the mailbox one hour and you're getting bored after 65 seconds just looking at it. So, what is this guy doing here? Who is the guy? Who wears these great trousers? In which country do people run around with these trousers? The US. The US, okay. <laughs> right. This is a U.S. mailman, and I never knew why they wear this gray trousers, but anyway, this is a U.S. mailman. Now, what is he doing? <laughs> Sorry? Emptying the mailbox? Is he emptying the mailbox? Delivering the mailbox? Delivering some mails, maybe. Sorry? Delivering the mail to... He's delivering the mail? I don't know. I don't think you have looked very well. Yeah. Yeah, taking it out, putting it back. Is this, I mean, is this like useful what he's doing? No. Sorry? You, the basic thing? The basic basic thing is that he's looking at information on the block. That is a useful thing to do, is to the nature Is that useful? Well, would you say we're not taking the CSV plot this useful? <laughs> I wouldn't well, say that it's useful. So, okay, <laughs> just another, why, why is the guy checking the mailbox so many times? Because he's trying to make sure. Sorry? He's trying to make sure that, I don't know, maybe uh, it's a right or he's doing right. I don't know. Something. He's, sorry? He's doing right. He's doing right? Is he doing right? No. no. Because no. Because he's he's not not why is he checking the mailbox? What drives his behavior? Yeah, you, 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 you stick with usefulness, but we are, we are already with another question. Why is this person... Do you think it's pathological? It's pathological. It is pathological. Why is it pathological? Because he can't stop doing it. He can't stop doing it, that's right. He can't stop doing it, that's right. Is it useful? Doing this 50 times? No. 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 Normally you would do it? Just once. I'll do it. Just once. You're a confident person. That's good. <laughs> Some people do it five times, but normally you have to do it. This guy is doing 50 times, but still he isn't pleased. What drives him to do this behavior? Which thing inside his mind? You have read too many OCD papers. <laughs> Is, but that, is, is that his primary drive? Why is he checking the mailbox so many times? He probably doesn't even know why he's doing it either. Do you think so? Yes. I think that, I think that he is obsessed that he doesn't want to make mistakes. He doesn't want to make mistakes? Yeah, that could be perfectionistic. Couldn't it be that he just wants to be certain that no mail is left in the box? That's it. No? He's interested in absolute certainty, right? Does it exist absolute certainty? How do we reach certainty in life? We reach certainty because we believe it's certain. So certainty is a feeling, it's not knowledge. That's the problem with obsessive compulsive disorder. They want to have that feeling of being certain, which is based on a belief. Okay, 
Shall I go on? We can we just later on we can have many more questions. Okay, this is typical OCD. When I started, I mean in 2000, OCD was an anxiety disorder in the DSM. And the, the main hypothesis was that OCD was associated with serotonin. Why was it associated with a dysfunction of the serotonin system? Anyone an idea? Which arguments do psychiatrists use to prove that something has a neurobiological substrate? Which stupid, ridiculous argument that I read all the time in papers do they use? Why is schizophrenia associated with dopamine? Because the treatment that targets the dopamine system has an efficiency. Exactly. Because SSRIs or treatments, they work through a kind of system. So there's a reasoning that if these drugs work through a system, that the system is associated with a disorder. Is that a good reasoning? Is that a good argument? No, no, but it could be, but not necessarily. Anyway, in the case of OCD, they used clomipramine, which is a very powerful serotonin reuptake inhibitor, more than that, but at least clomipramine in the 70s. It was very effective, so people said, wow, serotonin has something to do with OCD. And even more so, they checked in the, in, uh, in, in the plasma levels serotonin, before and after clomipramine, and they saw there was a change. They did it for dopamine, nodulin, and serotonin, and there was an exclusive change in serotonin. So they said, well, OCD is associated with serotonin. But if you look at it closely, there are some problems. First of all, all SSRIs, how many SSRIs do we have as of yet? Five, six? There is no relation between uptake selectivity whatsoever and the effect of SSRIs. Secondly, if you do a tryptophan depletion, it doesn't work in OCD. And normally in depression, it has an impact on your outcome. Third, only half of the patients respond to SSRIs, just 50%. The other 50% do not respond. So that, when I started to do my research, I saw these patients, they were refractory, so I thought maybe we should add another compound and see whether it's effective. And I just tried to use an antipsychotic because I thought maybe we should add another system on top of the serotonergic system, just as a pilot. I was a junior scientist and I didn't know very well what to do. So my idea was, let's add ketiapine to SSRIs for treatment refractory OCD patients. Why ketiapine? What is ketiapine? No, somebody know? It's an antipsychotic? And it's an atypical antipsychotic. It's a very complicated compound. As you can see, it binds to several different receptors. It was the third atypical antipsychotic that was brought on the market in the 90s. So we, the other ones are respiridol, olanzapine, and ketiapine is another one. It's quite sedative. Why did I use ketiapine? It was actually no scientific reason. It was a financial one. The company was prepared to pay the study. So I did it with ketiapine. And it was never been done, so I thought if I have to do all the effort, well, I can use ketiapine and then I can have like a nice paper because I'm the first one. Being the first one is still important in science. So I did a pilot study. I added ketiapine to SSRIs. We know that in OCD, antipsychotics and monotherapy do not work. They're completely ineffective. In this case, it was interesting because SSRIs did not work in these patients because they were treatment refractory, and we know that ketiapine didn't work. So it was a quite a gamble, a, a, combining two ineffective drugs for treatment refractory OCD patients. But I was lucky because uh, we found in a pilot study that the combination was effective, and I did later on a placebo control study. Um, in 40 patients, and you can see here, this graph shows you the placebo effect. So this is actually an SSRI with um, placebo as add-on, and this is an SSRI with ketiapine as add-on, and you see a nice decrease on the CGI. This is a global scale measuring clinical severity. Um, so over eight weeks, there was a nice improvement, 
and I proved clinically that addition of ketiapin to SSRIs was effective. What was my next question? How does it work? Yeah? That was, my, that was indeed my question. How is it possible that two ineffective drugs combined are effective? How could I solve that question? What could I do trying to find out what the mechanism of action was? Is there something, is there a technique that I could just use in humans trying to find out? Or any other technique? Nowadays you can just go into animals. Sorry? Nowadays you can just use animals. Yes, nowadays, but as well 15 years ago. <laughs> so I went to the animals and I say, well, I will try to administer ketiapin, SSRIs, and a combination in animals, and I will use microdialysis and see what happens in the brain in different brain areas. And I will measure dopamine, serotonin, and noradrenaline, and see whether either SSRIs or ketiapin or the combination has an impact on one of these systems in one of the brain areas. That was exactly what I did. Okay, and that's what I found. Um, and it's maybe a complicated graph, but I will show you the, the most important data. So this is the dopaminergic change here on this bar graph. This is serotonergic change. This dopaminergic change in the prefrontal cortex. And this curve is actually the most important one. This shows that the combination of ketiapin, in this case it was fluvoxamine, was a practical thing because fluvoxamine is well in SSRI, but it doesn't stick to the plastic tubes using microdialysis, so it, for me it was convenient. So in this case, I combined ketiapin and fluvoxamine in rodents, measured with microdialysis dopaminergic change, and I saw that there was a synergistic increase. So combining two ineffective drugs resulted in a huge increase of dopamine in the prefrontal cortex. And I thought, what is going on over here? I mean, SSRIs are effective in OCD. OCD has been related to the serotonergic system. And what I see now is the only effect is an increase of dopamine in the prefrontal cortex. What was the next question? Yes. No, no, no. It's a good question, but these were just normal rats, non-OCD rats. It was a very simple study, administration of drugs in just like wild type rats. Because my question was, what is the effect on these systems in uh, these three, diff four different brain areas? So I found out that it changed or increased dopamine in the prefrontal cortex. What would be your next step? Knowing that there is a I mean, something hints at the dopaminergic system. What could we do next? Other brain structures. Sorry? Other brain structures. Other brain structures? Other well, we structures. measured in the striatal area. I'll just show you the positive effect in the prefrontal cortex. Yeah? Yes, that's a good one. Yeah. Which element, and what, is, what would be your hypothesis? <laughs> if it's because of a recall. Like a specific receptor. That's what we did, you're right. So what we did is we blocked all the receptors of the ketiapin and then tried to find out which one was responsible for the synergistic increase. But we, that was not my first question. That's an interesting one, and we did it, but it was my third question. Why was the first question knowing that it changed the dopaminergic system in rodents. I went back to the humans and I thought, wow, something is changing in the dopaminergic system. Nobody wrote about dopamine in, in, in OCD, so what should I do? Measure dopamine in humans. So, how could I do that? How could I measure dopamine, the dopaminergic system in humans? Sorry? Imaging. imaging, right? Which kind of imaging could I use? Pets. Pets, yeah, that was quite fancy 15 years ago. It was not available in my hospital, but there is a much more simple technique that we used. It's nearly the same, it's PECT. 
We did like a SPECT study. We used IBASIDEM, which binds to the dopamine D2 receptor, and measured whether dopamine was dysfunctional in OCD patients. That's exactly what we did. So, and these are the results. We found that with IBASIDEM, in patients with OCD, there was less D2 receptor binding in the striatal areas which was interesting because, again, it was the first time that was shown in humans that there's something wrong with the dopaminergic system. So a lower level of dopaminergic D2 receptor binding in OCD. What could be the reason of less D2 receptor binding of ibizetam? Why does ibizetam best bind less to D2 receptors? I give you just, I mean, the way we thought about. Maybe you have more ideas. Okay, there's a lower D2 receptor binding, so we thought either there is a lot of endogenous dopamine in the striatal areas, so it competes with ibizetam, and then we have less binding, or there are just a lower number of available D2 receptors in the brain in the striatal areas of OCD patients. And if so, that could be the consequence of the fact that there's a degeneration of postsynaptic striatal cells, or it could be due to genetic variability of the D receptor gene, or it could be because of the downregulation of the D2 receptor, which actually is the result, of, could be the result of high levels of endogenous dopamine in the striatal level. There was no degeneration of postsynaptic cells. That would be highly unlikely because that would like, be the same like uh, Parkinson's disorder, um, and you need a lot of degeneration to see symptoms, so that was something that we uh, didn't take into account. We did some uh, DNA studies, looked at the genetic variability. There was, I mean, there, came, there was no positive result. So we ended up with a downregulation of the D2 receptor due to increased dopamine activity in the striatal area. So OCD was related or is related with increased dopamine levels in the striatal area. Using an antipsychotic in combination with SRIs results in a synergistic increase in the prefrontal cortex of dopamine, which on the long run will decrease dopamine in the striatal areas because increased dopamine levels in the PFC will lead to decreased levels in the striatal area. In a way, we had a story. But what was the, the other thing that we had to do? We know that dopamine was involved, but how could I understand dopamine activity? OCD is, is an anxiety disorder. What has anxiety to do with, dopamine, with the dopaminergic system? What would you do? And you go, go back to the animals? Yeah? And what would you do? Fear conditioning in animals? And what would be the hypothesis? Yeah. So you would look for an association between fear and dopamine. Okay. What we did, I, I sticked with the humans, and I thought, okay, I know that dopamine is involved, but why? Why should OCD be associated with dopamine? So what I did was a very simple study again. It's a functional MRI study. I tried to know why exactly dopamine was dysfunctional. So I said it was just a hypothesis. Maybe there is something wrong with the reward system because dopamine is famous for its reward. So we never checked whether the reward system in OCD is dysfunctional. So we used a simple paradigm. It's a nuts and task. We modified it. The task consists of um, patients and we asked them to push a button like this here. And before they push the button, they get a, there's a cue. If there is like a green circle, and you push the button within a certain time limit, then you get two euros. If there is a, like a square as a queue, and you push the button, you will get nothing. You train the patients, put them in the scanner, and then you can measure what happens during the queue, the anticipation of the reward, and the feedback. And actually, the, the whole game was a bit manipulated because in any patient, 50% of the cases, it was wrong or right. They didn't know that, they just played and were happy but actually it was completely manipulated that helped us analyzing the results. So what did we find? In OCD patients, there was less activity in the nucleus accumbens 
during prediction of rewards. So in normal people, when they see the queue and they have a reward anticipation, you see activation of the nucleus accumbens. That was completely absent in OCD patients. So OCD patients show dysfunctional, re dysfunctional reward system with less activity of the accumbal area. And that could, of course, have ex that could explain, of course, some uh, or could uh, hint to some association with dopamine. I'm going to show you uh, another graph, which is a bit easier to see. This shows you the controls, uh, the left accumbens and the right accumbens activity during the reward anticipation. And we made a distinction between high-risk assessment patients and contamination fear patients. And particularly in the contamination fear patients, you see very nicely um, a decreased accumbens function in the left and the right side compared with normal controls. Okay. So after uh, all these studies, it took me several years, I thought maybe the idea that OCD is an anxiety disorder related to serotonin is not the best idea. Maybe we should see it differently and see OCD as a dysfunction of the reward system associated with dopamine. But how could I do that? Could I do that at that time? I mean, Im imagine that everyone says that OCD is an anxiety disorder related to serotonin. What is the, the I mean, what are, what are the, the, the concepts that I could use trying to convince other people that OCD is actually a, a, a disorder related to reward dysfunction? Uh, use dopamine agonist and see if it induces the corruption in agonists. Yeah, that would be like a neurobiological way, proving that it's, again, associated with OCD. But just, I mean... On, on, the, on the level of the understanding of the disorder? How can I convince my colleagues? Which symptoms of OCD can I understand within the paradigm of rewards and dopamine? Optimize the behavior. Sorry? Optimize the behavior. Also. I don't understand. Optimize the behavior. So if you have, if you have a very specific behavior or task which analyzes reward in yeah. OCD patients and do a study where you block dopamine activity. How many OCD symptoms are there? I don't know. Anyone have an idea? I don't know. There are three major symptoms. Meaning that you can... This is a type of symptom, but yes. I mean like a form of symptom. There are three symptoms and they are always present in OCD patients. Shaking. Repetitive action. Obsessions. Anxiety, of course. And compulsions. What is a compulsion? You can't stop. That's what the guy did. Can't stop checking or cleaning or whatsoever. So compulsion is a repetitive behavior. And there was a concept at that time. It was, it was the first time that, it was, that people uh, um, wrote about it. And it was the concept of behavioral addiction. And it was the idea that people become addicted to their behavior. Like the guy checking the mailbox. It's possible that it's completely useless, but for some reason, he gets addicted to it, which is strange because OCD patients, they don't like to perform the behavior. Actually, they really hate it. Who wants to check the mailbox for hours? No one. But these patients, they perform these behaviors. They check the mailbox and they do it for many, many hours. For some reason, when they start, they check it once, then twice, then 12 times, and then they end up doing it for hours. Why? Because they become addicted to the behavior. The behavior itself is the source of the addiction. If you do something a long time and it's, you're doing it a lot of time, you can get addicted to it, even if you don't like it. So the concept of behavioral addiction to me was a very attractive one because it could explain why patients perform their compulsions. And it was like an addictive process. In the beginning, it's, use, it's useful. Suppose that you have these filthy ideas, you wash your hands, you like it, after a while you have the feeling that you're clean, but then again, after weeks and months, you start to repeat them and you end up with washing your hands for six, seven hours a day. So you develop like a process, an addictive process, similar as heroin and cocaine users. So I saw compulsions as an addictive process a longer process that started with something useful and it ended up with completely, something completely useless. Okay, the cortical striator circuitry is a circuit that we use to explain um, obsessive compulsive behaviors. I 
guess that any, everyone is familiar with the cortical striator circuitry. The idea in OCD is that there is like a net excitation of the whole system. So there is less inhibition and there is increased excitation. So that's why people go on and on and on. So the basal ganglia are actually like a pacemaker in the brain. They start to give you ideas, thoughts, or actions, and you continue to have them all the time, like a real pacemaker in the heart, but then on a mental level. And it doesn't stop because this circuitry is continuously activated. Okay, that's how I started. And I, went, I was ready for my next step. So what would be the next step, knowing all this? You have OCD patients, you know that dopamine is uh, related, that you can understand it with a reward dysfunction. What would be your next question? Can I stop it? Sorry? Can I stop it? Yes, can I stop it? How could I stop that behavior? And where should I stop it? And how could I stop it? Targeting the dopaminergic system. Yes, and how could I do that? In animals. In animals, but I don't treat animals. I, pre I treat patients. I'm paid to treat patients, of course. So I went back to the patients and I thought, okay, how can I help them? I have new knowledge, I was paid for it, but how can I help them? So that was my next question. Of course, it's uh, maybe an obvious one, but my question was, how can I manipulate the accumbens, which is dysfunctional in OCD patients? How can I change accumbens activity? And how could I do that? Of course, with deep brain stimulation. So I was happy that I had access to deep brain stimulation 13, 14 years ago, and I used DBS to treat OCD patients. Everyone knows what it is, DBS? I don't have to explain it? Yeah? Okay. Or is someone, I mean, are you, is everyone, Honesty here, because you're not really reacting honestly, is my opinion. Could you, could you don't you understand it? Good. Yeah? Right? No. I don't understand. Because a lot of people, and they hear about the brain stimulation, but a few people actually do it. That's why it's interesting to, understand, to explain a little bit. So, it involves implantation of two electrodes in the brain, on the left and the right side. It's attached to a battery, which is implanted in the chest wall. The battery delivers continuous electrical activation all day on, continuously, in small segments. You need three things to do deep brain stimulation. An electrode, here you can see, an electrode is actually a plastic tube. It's very flexible. You put it in the brain. It's like um, you put something into cooked spaghetti. It's very soft, the brain. You can just put the electrode and it, it doesn't hurt anything. It just pushes, I mean, the, the brain a bit aside and you put it just at the spot where you want to have it. Quite easy. Here you can see two types of electrodes. These are very old electrodes. They have, and on the tip of the electrode, consists of four metal contact points, 1.5 millimeter. The distance between the contact points, that may vary. You can see here, this is half a millimeter between the contact points. If you're very confident, if you think that you know everything, you use these, con these electrodes, because you're sure that with the placement of this electrode, you target the good, um, the good circuitry that is associated with the dysfunction. If you're not confident, you use these big electrodes, because if you're wrong, you can switch to another brain area. The distance between these contact points is 1.5 millimeter. Of course, in Amsterdam, we use <laughs> these electrodes. <laughs> sure, okay. Okay, the electrode is attached to a battery. This is, again, an old battery. In, at, in the older days, we used two batteries. Now we have one battery. The battery is a crucial thing in deep brain stimulation. Why is it crucial? Why is it much more crucial in psychiatric patients than in Parkinson patients? Because it stops the negative symptoms of this psychiatric patient can come back in a... Uh, yeah. But what is, I mean... Suppose that you're 35 years old, you have OCD, you get DBS, the battery is implanted in the chest wall. I made the cut, put the battery in, and the battery lasts how long? How long does the battery last with DBS and psychiatry? A few years. Less? Between eight months 
and, eight, and a year and a half maximum. So the battery is crucial because if it works, you have to change, replace the battery each year on average. You can do it once, twice, three times, or after six times. This here becomes a bit ugly. It's difficult to put a battery in. So that, that's why we put all effort in increasing the battery time, reducing the voltage, so that it is a very, there is a long battery time. In Parkinson, it, the duration, I mean, the, that battery lasts for three, four years, three and a half. In psychiatry, on average, one year. So for us, I mean, the development of the battery is very, very important. We have now rechargeable batteries. These are old batteries. All our patients, 80% of our patients, use rechargeable batteries. So you have to recharge them like your cell phone. You have a battery, and then put something on top of it, and then each two days, recharge them so they're full again. These batteries, they last for eight or nine years. That's a new type of, of battery. Of course, for, the, for us, it's interesting, except that we have to deal with OCD patients, and the problem is that some of them are so perfectionistic that the battery needs to be full all the time. And what they do, a, they start to have compulsions about the battery recharges uh, anyway. So there will be new batteries, and there will be like a, a, a two euro coin, and they will be phrased in to the skull, on top of the skull, which make it much easier. And I mean, in the future, there is even a concept to draw electricity from your own brain activity so that it can charge your electrode. Our brains produce electricity, sufficient electricity to provide these electrodes with its own electricity. So that's, that's the next development. OK, that device over there, what is that? It's, it, once it's set in, when the neurosurgeon has implanted the electrodes, we use this device to optimize the variables, the parameters. So when the electrode is implanted, nothing happens. It's just there. So DBS is not treat, just the treatment. DBS is and implantation of electrode and the neuromodulation. The neuromodulation is done by a neurologist, a nurse, psychologist, psychiatrist whatsoever. And the crucial point of this person is that he, has, he needs to know very well how the symptoms develop in this particular disorder. You have to have a lot of clinical knowledge to understand what you do with this device and see what, it, what happens with the patient. So we use this device to change the var Which variables can we change with DBS? Yeah? Two questions. One, uh, you decide about the length of the, the thickness or the length of that electrode before doing the surgery? Yeah. Uh, and how do you decide, like, what kind of analysis you do in order to... So as I said, if you are a confident person, you use the left electrode no, like what imaging technique do you use? Okay, we do always a uh, scan, just a regular MRI scan. Okay, that's a good, I understand your question now. So what we do, we do a scan, a 3T scan or even a 7T scan, and you build the brain, you put it in a computer, and it's like assembled virtually on your computer. And then you target your electrode virtually on the computer, so go through the brain of the patient, and see whether it doesn't touch any vessels or whatsoever. So that's actually what... The surgery? So you have to imagine people come are in a hospital uh, at, I, know, I think, they start at eight o'clock, we do the MRI. Uh, the MRI takes, I think, half an hour. Then we go upstairs, we do the targeting with the neurosurgeon, that takes an hour. Um, and in the meantime, the patient is uh, brought to the operating room. Then uh, the implantation start is under general anesthesia because we know very well where it is and there is no, I mean, nothing to check. So that it takes the implantation of the electrodes takes, I think, one hour, two hours. Then there's a rest and then the battery is implanted uh, in a second time. Yeah. So it's nearly a day, the whole procedure. And the day after, people can go home. It's a very, I mean, actually a very simple neurosurgical technique. Once that is done, which takes one day, then we start to optimize the electrode. That takes several months. So each week the patient comes to our hospital. 
We ask them how they do, how many compulsions they have, obsessions, and so on. We check it, we put it on a scale, and so on. And then we change the variables, try to find the best effects with our optimized variables, the least side effects. Then they go home for another week, come back, and so on. And that's, and after a while, four, five, six months, we have found the best results. Yeah? Okay, so um, I will go on a bit faster. DBS is used now in psychiatry, yes? It depends. So um, half of the patients have quit all the drugs. They don't use it anymore. Uh, and the other half still use the drugs. I don't think it has an effect, but some people are kind of, they trust still their drugs and are reluctant to quit drugs, despite the fact that DBS might be very effective. Yeah? Okay, these are the disorders that have been used now for, in psychiatry for D-brain simulation. So on top, OCD. I think on average 200 patients now worldwide has been implanted. Tourette syndrome, my guess is 60 or 80 patients. Depression, 150 patients, 200 patients probably. Anorexia nervosa, alcohol addiction, Alzheimer, and then cocaine and heroin addiction. And lately, I mean, each six months there is like a new indication, obesitas, tinnitus, uh, so there will be several new indications there, exploring schizophrenia and so on, uh, hallucinations. So I guess in the future there will be many more indications for deep brain stimulation. As soon as you know whether a particular brain area is involved in uh, psychiatric disorders, you can consider deep brain stimulation. Okay, why is deep brain stimulation so interesting? I mean, it's complicated. It's, it's uh, very expensive. You need a neurosurgeon, which is as well complicated. Why would we do that? Side effects? Sorry? Does it have side effects? As as that would be a reason not to do it if it has side effects. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. No, it has side effects. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So the reason why I like it is that going back to the brain mind problem, I mean, DBS is like a bridge. Here you see a patient. And uh, we took an, a, like a scan. You can see the electrode in her brain. And the electrode is somewhere in the accumbal area. You see here the leads. And then one electrode here. And this patient is smiling. Why is, why, why is, he, is, he, is he smiling here? Exactly. She's smiling because I stimulated her brain here. So with BBS, I can change the behavior of patients. I can manipulate behavior. I can activate it, deactivate it, I can induce depression, I can induce panic attacks, I can induce laughter, and so on. So it's a nice tool for a neuroscientist. You can really change human behaviors. But there's something else. This woman is smiling. But what I could do with my deep brain stimulation lecture as well is I can record what happens when she's smiling. So the electrodes that we use now, they can stimulate, but as well record. We can record local field potentials in the accumbal area while patients perform their behaviors. So I can stimulate the brain so that she smiles, but while she's smiling because I have told her a joke, I can measure in the brain in vivo immediately while she, what happens in the accumbens while she's smiling. That's why DBS is such an interesting tool. It's a kind of bridge between the mind and the brain. Okay, so we uh, targeted the nucleus accumbens. Here you can see a model of our electrodes, uh, of our electrode 3389, which is a small distance between the contact points. This is an image of the, um, the brain, caudate, putamen, internal capsule, core of the accumbens and the shell of the accumbens. So we put our electrode through the internal capsule and the lowest contact point, that's the one that you can see on a scan, because you cannot see the electrode, it's because of flexible plastic material. You can only see these four contact points. The lowest contact point is actually near or above the core of the accumbal area and goes through the internal capsule. The design that we use is, is the following one. We use it for all patients in the past 10 years. So uh, we did now 85 patients with different disorders. So they go to surgery one day, then there is a, like a relaxing moment, they rest for seven days, and then we start to optimize the variables between two and eight months. Once we think that I have reached the best result, we invite them to participate 
in a placebo-controlled blinded phase of twice two weeks. So what people do is they come to our hospital and it's either put off or on or on or off. They don't know, just to check whether the effects are really due to deep brain stimulation and not placebo. And then we, of course, there's a follow-up of patients. And because we're the only center in the Netherlands, we have to follow up till they die. So it's a huge investment because all the patients, they stay at our hospital. Of course, once they have a good effect, they don't come often. But anyway, each year there's like a checking a control moment. Okay. So my next question was, um, is DBS of the nucleus accumbens effective in OCD? I've explained what it is. Is it effective? I'll show you again, uh, much more precise, our electrodes. This is uh, a scan showing the electrode in a patient with the lowest contact points. And you can see here on the atlas that the lowest contact point, again, is between the core and the shell of the accumbens. But this is not the effective contact points. So there's often a mistake. If you read a paper of DBS, take an account that the target is not the same as the effective contact point that you use to change the symptoms. In our case, the contact points are much more above. This is just a slide showing you how we stimulate. So we have, as you see, four contact points, these blocks, one, two, one, two, three, four. This is activation of one contact point. You see monopole, a single contact, gives you like uh, an active field. Um, we use always two contact points, so we activate two out of the four, and you get this kind of um, form here. And you can do it more precisely using um, different variables. That doesn't matter, actually. But we use always the middle contact points of our electrodes, so the active contact point is not the target contact point. The active contact point, in our case, is between, at the border between the accumbens and the internal capsule. And that's important because in the beginning, when people started with DBS, they thought that the effect was due to inhibition. The brain stimulation actually inhibits neural activity. It inhibits the cells or whatsoever. What we saw is that the effect of the brain stimulation is due to axonal activation. So in psychiatry, it's all the effect of white matter activation, not gray matter inhibition. And we're happy that we, with our electrodes, are at the border of the internal capsule because in all probability, we change white fibers that run through the lower part of the internal capsule. Okay, this is again our trial. Um, it's a bit complicated, we're gonna try to explain it to you. So people come to our hospital, there is a surgery. Um, then, as I said, we try to optimize the settings. This is period A, three to eight months. He can see the results in phase A. This is uh, a score that shows you the Y box. The Y box is a scale that we measure, that we use to measure OCD symptoms and depression and anxiety. And as you can see, there's a slow decrease of symptom severity in OCD, as well as anxiety and depression. Gradually, it goes down till this point. And that, here starts phase B. And their patients are asked to participate in a placebo-controlled trial. So what we did here is they are uh, invited to this double-blind phase. And this graph shows you what happens when we stop stimulation. See that all patients have a rebound effect. There's an increase again of symptoms and then decreased again when we change them to the active stimulation after two weeks. So on average, just to give an impression, I, don't, I won't, be, um, won't be long, this, this uh, um, explanation on the effect of DBS and OCD, but on average, we see, um, the, we see effects in OCD patients that are, I mean, divergent. Um, here you can see the, the, the percentage of symptom decrease. So the purple shows you between 80 and 100% decrease of symptoms. So my guess is that 14, between 40 and 20% of the patients, one out of five, are completely remitters. They don't have OCD symptoms anymore. You have to imagine these patients have been very ill. They had the symptoms for 16, 20 years. For example, cleaning for 12, year, for 12 hours a day. With this treatment, you can reduce it to 15 minutes. The majority of the patients experience a decrease between 60 and 80%. There's a group, 24% of the patients experiencing a decrease between 40 and 60, and so on. And I think that one out of five 
percent of the patients do not respond to deep brain stimulation OCD. I'm going to show you two movie clips of one of my patients, and unfortunately it cannot be taped because uh, she won't agree. It's actually, she's a nurse in neurology, and she suffered severe contamination fear for many, many years, an OCD patient. So you will see her after she has been treated for eight months. She did very well, was a good responder. But you will see her after one week off stimulation. So she is in an off stimulation, and we ask her how she feels. This is the first movie clip. Then we activate the electrodes, and then you will see what happens with her once the electrode is activated in the second video clip. OK. Gives you an impression, I guess. So what, what is your observation, seeing these patients? Sorry? <laughs> you, we modulate the memory. That's that's your first observation. Yes. Up, she's up to the okay. That's, yeah. She's not afraid yeah. She's not afraid anymore. She, like she said, she she's not afraid anymore. Yeah. She's not afraid anymore. No. She's so what is the, the the main effect that you see here? She's she's not, she's changing. not so. I don't understand if you were talking about because of the room, but. So one by one. What is the main effect? Mood improvement. You said more improvement? Someone else? Yes. Mood improvement? And anxiety? She's relaxed. She's relaxed, okay. So mood improvement, relaxed, anxiety change. What else? Yeah? How much? No, I think nothing, no, nothing. Because we always do a placebo controlled trial, and I don't think it, had any, it has any placebo effect. Yeah. I think there's also optimism. Optimism, yes. Yeah, there's optimism. So, what, what do psychiatrists say when they see this? They, they always criticize me. Why would they do that? Yeah, but if you see this, so the well, second she, part. She shows signs of pain. Yeah, exactly. So we have here a genuine psychiatrist. She shows signs of, not, well, hypomania. So the mood is to, I mean, increased to an extent that you can question whether this is like a normal mood. So hypomania is something that we often see with deep brain stimulation as well in neurological patients. So you can, you can, we can realize how difficult it is to judge whether this is like a normal behavior or an abnormal behavior if we treat patients with. So you can immediately realize how problematic DBS is from an ethical viewpoint. Because we have to think about not enhancing people. We are doctors, so we cure people. So it's, not, it's treatment, it's not enhancement. But you can see with DBS, you can enhance people. You can give them an improved mood. But if you follow this line of argument, you could even say, you know, the OCD is just there, but you're covering it up by producing this hypomania. Sure, that that's true. The, the in the that could be one of the interpretations. Because actually, yep. what you want is you want to inhibit the, the compulsive nature of the thought. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it's true, but it could be that by changing, increasing the mood and lowering anxiety, that the compulsions disappear. Do they with DBS and OCD patients? Other question. Yes, but I would, have, would like to have an answer to my question as well. But you can ask your question first. Uh, it's very interesting that my question is on hypomania. If you ask me, I would say the patient knew, her, although there is a two meter to greater than 17, she knew her problem. Maybe this hypermania may be the joy of rebound. Sure. It may be joy of rebound, not hypermania. No, that's, but the that's right. I mean, that's another invitation. You could say, this person is so glad that she got rid of all her symptoms 
that she's so relieved that she feels happy. It's not hypomania. I mean, we have a, there are a lot of actors in Hollywood who behave like that, no? <laughs> so, so, but again, still, whatever it is, I mean, it's something that you have to take account when you treat patients with DBS. What is, I mean, ethical good? Uh, is it enhancement? Is it treatment? Is it accepted? Is it not accepted? Is it because of she feels well or is it induced hypomania? These are the questions that we struggle with. Okay. So my other question was, what happens with the compulsions? So you have to remember, I started intervention in the Akambal area, and I was doing this because I thought that OCD is a kind of behavioral addiction with an emphasis on the compulsions, because compulsions are addictive processes. And I thought by changing activity in their comments that I could change behavioral addiction. So these symptoms that are important for behavioral addictions are compulsions. But how does it really work? In all my patients, the compulsions did not change. So my hypothesis of the behavioral addiction was completely wrong. It was the opposite. As you can observe yourself, when we change, when we induce, when we give DBS and we change the patients, the primary effect is mood improvement, anxiolytic effects, some effects on obsessions, but not the compulsions. The compulsions are there and are still there. So to give you an impression, for example, I treated a, a man, 55 years old, and he was afraid uh, of contamination. He never took a bus in his whole life refused to take a bus. We treated him with the brain stimulation, the anxiety completely disappears, no contamination fear at all, but he still refuses to take a bus because he did it for 30 years. Maybe because it was an addictive process, which is a completely different circuitry. So eventually we can treat them, but we have to add CBT, cognitive behavior therapy. We have to add CBT and with a psychotherapist, we have to desensitize them and learn them again to take buses. And then eventually, after a few months, they succeed and the compulsions disappear as well. But not naturally, not because of an effect of deep brain stimulation. What is the other thing that is, when you observe this patient, what is so striking, particularly if you're a psychiatrist? There's something incredibly exceptional in these patients with DBS. The quick response, I just activated DBS and within a seconds, she shows that behavior, which is threatening. I can indeed manipulate the behavior of patients. Normally, if you treat a patient with drugs and CBT, how long does it take till, till they improve? Months even. So with SSRIs, it takes you two, three months. With CBT as well, well, weeks, months, at least. So this goes within seconds. Second, what is exceptional, the complete reduction of symptoms. There is a flat line of, there's no anxiety anymore. The mood improves, so it's completely gone. This is highly unlikely in, in, in psychiatry. Most of the times there are always some symptoms. And the third thing which is exceptional, well, it's not exceptional, but it's something that we should take into account, is the global change. So if you see this patient, it's not that her symptoms have changed. No, she has changed as a person. So DBS has an effect on a person, not on the symptoms. We changed her globally. And that's something which is, uh, of course, as well important in deep brain simulation. But, but then you have it in some patients and not others. These three characteristics, you mean? No, you, you showed initially in how many, you know, you have your yeah. graph where you showed in how many patients you're yeah. efficient. There are also patients you're not efficient. Yes. So yeah. what do you think is the difference between those that you have efficient treatment and those that where you fail? I don't know. I have no idea. I mean, to me, it's, of course, to all of us very important because... But it's not trivial things like the electrode being in the wrong place. I mean, no, it's not the target. It's not the type of... For example, and then um, I think we have done a break. But I will just tell you uh, about a s story. We, I, I, um, there was, a, I think, the sixth patient that I uh, treated was a young girl, obsessive-compulsive disorder patient, and she suffered perfectionism. 
So she was so perfectionistic that when she got up in the morning and took her clothes on, that it took her six, seven hours to be ready because everything needed to be perfect, the trousers and so on. So she took her clothes on and off and so on. So the whole time. So she got up at eight and at three or four o'clock in the afternoon, she was ready because of perfectionism. Of course, completely invalidated because she do, could do nothing. She stayed in pajamas all the time. She couldn't go to school whatsoever. Okay, we treated her with the brain stimulation and it had no effect, at least in our opinion. There was a minimal effect on the symptoms. She, she, she was still very ill and we considered her to be a non-responder based on the criteria that we use, less than 20% effect on the Y box. So I started to exclude all patients with perfectionistic ideas in my sample because I thought perfectionism is like a predictor of non-response for DBS. I saw her, I think, two years ago, coincidentally, she came to my office and she said, well, Damien, Professor Denise, so in, in the Netherlands they say, Damien, we have a, like a flat uh, organization. I hear that you um, exclude patients with perfectionism in DBS. I think it's a pity. I said, yes, I did it because of your case, because you're a non-responder. And she said to me, yes, to you, I am a non-responder, but to me, DBS, it changed my life. And I said, wow, why did it change your life? It improved my mood. And it's not, a, it's not I mean, a big effect, but it's sufficiently big enough to keep me alive. So DBS changed my life. So again, it shows you, it's just an illustration that we as scientists, doctors, sometimes rate patients based on guidelines, based on scores, but that the subjective experience of a patient may be completely different. She felt very well, even with a minimal effect, and we as doctors, according to scientific principles, found that it was not good enough. And sometimes we use our criteria to exclude or include patients, but they may be completely wrong. Just an illustration to show you how careful we should be with judging patients on basis of criteria and scales. Okay, um, yeah? It has to be on all the time. Yeah, we did uh, some experiments with putting it off at night because it, I mean, we could uh, spare some battery time. And there were some patients complaining because they had obsessive compulsive symptoms in their dreams. And they woke up, which is funny, but that's the reason why we went on stimulation during night. But does that have no uh, other behavior that changes from the individual that he is keeping that elevated mood? In some cases, yeah, in some cases, for example, uh, in some cases there is elevated mood. So the typical hypomania that we saw here is something that is present in all patients the first three and five days, and then it disappears. It just naturally disappears. So it's a pity because all patients that I treat, they ask me, put me again in this initial situation, please. It's a huge drug effect, but it's lost. I can't give it back, so, but they always linger to that initial phase, but it's gone forever. So, and some of them are um, more stimulated than we wish, and they, ha they are in, a, in, in like a situation of more, you know, they're much more impulsive. So I, I, I don't think I have time to explain it, but there's like a relationship between the compulsivity and the impulsivity in our patients. So our patients are very compulsive, they're meticulous, they're shy, not at all very aggressive, so typical OCD patients. When we treat them with DBS, they improve, improve mood, less anxiety, and they become more, much more active, much more self-confident. If we high crank up the, the volume, the, the voltage, then they start to become impulsive, and they start to become aggressive, and they shout. If we decrease the activity, then they become a little bit more compulsive. So one other case, to illustrate how interesting this is, I treated a person, an artist. He's a, a painter, not a very good painter, but artists always think they're very good. Anyway, a painter, and he had like the, li the life of an artist. A lot of drugs and women and so on, but he was depressed for a long time, 15 years. Treated him with DBS, and he improved very well. And he started to paint again, was active again, and he started to pick up his life as an artist. But in the meantime, he was married. He had three children. So his wife came to me to my office and she said, 
good that you treated my husband, good that he's improved, but could you please lower the activity and make him a bit more depressed so that he fits into my, my family structure? So again, this shows you how complicated it is that sometimes you, by playing with these electrodes, with these variables, you can improve or uh, change patients so that, it, that they doesn't fit anymore in their primary environment. And that um, patients have different ideas about treatment than um, the environment and husbands or whatsoever. Okay? Yeah? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. In some cases, uh, the activation, I mean, once it has been set, uh, goes on and on and on without any problem. We have seen patients while changing the battery that they lost their effect and that they actually, they, we couldn't, I mean, find the same improvement as they had with an earlier battery. And in some cases, even in some patients, only a few of them, we completely lost the effect. So that's true, and we don't know why, but that happens sometimes, yeah. That's, of course, terrible in some, in some cases that you have treated them, they responded, and after battery change, they, we are unable to find a good, uh, good, the good variable so that they do not have the effect of the improvement anymore. Yeah? Um, you tried it on uh, the press uh, patient. Yeah. No. Bipolar is a contraindication. Why? Because we can induce hypomania and mania. That's true. So that's why we do not accept. Do you actually found a way to modulate this in bipolar? Yeah, but we, we do, I mean, we exclude them because there might be a possibility. So psychosis is a contraindication, and as well bipolar disorder. Uh, yeah, it's unpredictable. So from the perspective of someone who wants to understand behavior at the cellular level, what's wrong in the accumbens of someone who has OCD? Um, I don't think it's, there's something wrong in the accumbens. Okay. I think okay, there's so something wrong the in the... The target you've chosen is not even where you have... Well, I sh I'll show you in the second part. Okay. Some things change in the accumbens, so there's a local activity. Um, but there is as well, I mean, a remote activity. It has something to do with the change of the circuitry. So the effects are remote as well. We change the medial prefrontal cortex. So um, that's why I'm hesitant answering your question uh, um, with, with one single, uh, very, uh, I mean, simple answer. It's, it's complicated. It's both the accumbens, but as well something within the circuitry. And I do not know which part of the accumbens is important. Okay, maybe we can discuss later. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah.